welcome back to the Rumble of a Sewing Room. I've decided on another project. Now, I've already got a Garrick, which is uh, a heavy overcoat, a great coat, uh, made of heavy material with various capes over the top of it. And I was thinking about what would I have for the summer? Well, what better than a duster? A duster is a lighter version of an overcoat uh, designed more for the summer months and the idea was that a gentleman would wear it uh, when he was out during the day, possibly sporting, uh, and especially it was constructed so that he could ride on a horse. The various film versions of uh, Mr Darcy have got dusters of their own and they appear regularly on the TV programmes as well. So I decided I wanted one for myself. Now, I searched all over, but I couldn't find uh, a specific pattern for a duster. So I had to resort to a bit of inventiveness and started to look at the pattern that I'd used before for making my Garrick. And that was uh, Laughing Moon number 136, the men and ladies great coat and Garrick. Uh, what I then had to do was um, be a little bit uh, inventive about the uh, various versions that Laughing Moon gave, uh, be a bit more careful about the measurements, and uh, also quite a lot of what I wanted to achieve was done by having a much thinner fabric for the, uh, the construction. It's not exactly what uh, I wanted entirely, but it's pretty close. So, I'll save you the tedium of uh, my cutting out all of the pieces. And uh, here we have them all set out for you to see. So you can see the amount of pieces that go into a coat. Now you can see that I've got some fabric and lining for each of the flaps. And I have to stitch round the outside, not this side and stop at each of those dots. And uh, when you've done that, clip the corners and trim the seams. And here we are, back from the ironing board. One of the pleasures of working with this, of course, is it presses beautifully. Yeah! I wish I had a bigger table, but I haven't. So like everybody else who's normal, I'm down onto the floor because this is so big. So the next step is you take your flap, right sides to right sides, and you put it on the edge there, matching up with the, the notches that you've got on the corner. And at this point, you simply baste it into position. Now, when you're basting things, I don't know whether you've got any of these. They're like little crocodile clips. And they're very handy. Cheap as chips. Get them off the net. But they keep things in position whilst you're basting. And it stops it creeping around. So that by the time you get to the end of an edge, it's still in the right place. There we are. And you do the same for the other side. Now, whilst you're down on the floor, you've got the pocket bag to stick in as well. Now, the thing to remember about this is you're not constructing it before you've assembled the coat. So you're putting it just in single sides and you will later sew the bag together. So we're only talking about single pieces at this stage. So what you do is you place your pocket bag in the same position as the flap. And here we have the two halves of the back. And what we're going to do in the same way is fix the half pocket linings onto them so that, as you can imagine, when they come together, you will then sew it along. So, same thing, baste them in position. The next step is to sew between the marks. Now, you've put these on with your uh, tailor's tacks right at the beginning, didn't you? So you sew between there and there. Trim it. 
and bearing in mind that this is going to need to be turned inside out in order to avoid puckers on that seam you have to clip it to the symbols where you stopped stitching so there and there right the next step is to make sure that those pocket linings are in the right place so with the larger part the front you fold the pocket away and you press it pocket out flap in here we have the back for the back there isn't a pocket flap to think about so the bag is pressed out this is where it comes together what you need is the two parts of the back and the front and right sides together you match along this seam you're going to be sewing along this seam around the pocket and then up Don't forget to stop this terrace tack because this is where you pivot. You're going to start coming across towards the pocket. Right, we're back from the ironing board now, and as you can see, we've pressed the seams open. For the uh, curved seams, we've clipped them. And you will see on the pocket that we've gone to the red dots, gone around the pocket, and then continued up the seam. Now, when you come here, the pocket is folded towards the front, and you will see that the seam appears not to fit properly. It does, because if you look at the front, there's your flap, and the pattern says that there should be a pleat at the top here, and no pleat at the bottom. So then you end up with a pocket flap, which is triangular, and also with the pleat, there's a bit of room for expansion when you put your hand inside. So don't worry about that seam, it's meant to be like that. And then when you're ready, you pin those in place just for now. Uh, later on in the pattern, there's going to be some buttons which are going to hold them in the right position. But you need, just for now, to keep them in the right place. Underneath, that's where the flap is. At the back of the, uh, the duster, there is a choice to make as to how far up the vent at the back of the duster goes. Um, if you think about it, the original ones were designed for a gentleman to sit on horseback, and so the, the, uh, the back would normally be joined only to waist level, so that the coat could split and then move out on either side of the horse. Um, that's the way I'm going to do it. Uh, but you also have a choice to uh, join it far further down. Now, when you've stopped switch, uh, stitching at that point there, which is the square on the pattern, you have to cut down to it and clip down just there. Once you've cut that down, the top will fold over five eighths and then the back will fold over two and five eighths. Let's go to the ironing board and get those sorted. Let's have a talk about that vent at the back because whilst you'll never see it when you're wearing it, it is in fact visually quite an important part of the coat. People will see you walking away and it is part of the flowing nature of the way that it's worn that this fits right. 
So if we look down what we've got so far, we've got the vent and it's been pressed into position and the pattern says, assuming that it's going to be um, felted wool so it doesn't need edging, that you just fix it there. Well it needs to be a little bit more than that with my material because as you can see it does tend to fray and so what I've done is I've created a very very small uh, fold over there which will catch all of the uh, the loose edges so to close it what you need to use is what's called an invisible long half back stitch it's a right mouthful isn't it let's see if I can make that clearer you go in and follow the top of the crease and then you go catch a few little threads on the back material and back into the edge and go along and come out again and carry on like that and what you see you've done is you've created a lock stitch there so it pins that down and stops it moving and it won't slide along can you see that because that stitch has come up and back on itself and locked and you go all the way down the seam just like that so there we have it the backs all sewn together the sides are ready so the next step is to sew the shoulders together so let's have a review see where we've got to we've finished off the back vent now and you can see that that's all pinned in place and once it's ironed it's virtually invisible uh, we've got our flaps in position now we can get our hands inside to the pocket and then what you have to do in order to get that vent to hang nicely you put it on a hanger or a form of some kind I've got it on my mannequin here and uh, you make it so that when it hangs you've pinned that in position to maintain that overlap. Okay, we can put the coat to one side for a while now because what we have to move on to doing is the collar. And for the collar you need four pieces of the fabric and two of the interfacing. Now, um, two of those you can put to one side, those come in later. But what we then have to do is sew the outer part of the collar together. Uh, right sides together and we'll sew those. Bearing in mind the uh, tailor's tacks that you have made tailor's tacks again here go at the bottom. It's the opposite side to the side which is being sewn. The next step is for fixing the interfacing to the collar. Now you've got a choice here, either you will have selected an interfacing that's fusible, which will make things a lot easier, though in my experience the fusible interfacing can over time begin to detach and you'll end up with bubbles on your collar which isn't terribly nice. Alternatively, you can do it the traditional way, which is by pad stitching and uh, the pattern provides a template for the pad stitching. Uh, the lines of pad stitching are the means whereby the uh, interfacing is fixed to the fabric and uh, whilst it is very lengthy uh, it can be quite satisfying because by the time you've finished you end up with a collar that's got the classical pad stitching dimples on the back of it. The reason you need to watch out for these lines is that they're not straight to the collar, they curve. And that will be important when it comes to the pad stitching of the collar. Right, we need to anchor 
the collar in its position and so what we're going to do is we're going to stitch all the way along the roll line and then come back the same way and this is where the pad stitching starts make yourself a cup of tea make sure you got your thimble so your fingers don't get sore because this is going to take a long time and the way that you pad stitch is let's say I'm pad stitching along this line we fold so that the collar is hanging along that line don't crease it just fold it at this stage I'm preforming it and in order to be able to do this you put your hand inside so that the bit that you're stitching on is folded around your finger now the basic principle of pad stitching is that once we've got this anchor going right the way down the middle we are going to get rid of the pins and start stitching all the way along these other lines as you're doing that the the movement will tend to make the collar want to curl so as you're stitching it'll take that little bit up it will follow the curvature which is being created by your finger there and it will make the collar want to stay in that position so when it's finished it will want to stay like that now the the stitching itself isn't going to be pretty but the purpose of this is to show how it actually works and you can then concentrate on getting an even result for yourself as we said the purpose of pad stitching is to create lots of little stitches all over the surface of this so as to hold the two together and what you do is you go in and then you catch just a little bit of the fabric underneath let's have a look we don't want that much just that maybe even less if you can manage it and you come up and then go down through catch a tiny little bit and come up Yeah, maybe they could be smaller, but I'm doing this to show you how to do it. Down, through, catch a little bit, and through. And you can see what's happening is it's creating these um, diagonal lines. So we carry on doing that all the way down, through, catch a little bit, up again. And what I'm doing in order to catch it, I'm just feeling it on the end of my finger and then pulling back ever so slightly so as to create the smallest stitch that I possibly can. On the back, tiny little stitches. Now obviously I'm using red to show you um, where they are so you can see it clearly. But you would choose a cotton which is the same colour as your fabric and hopefully what you will end up with is a patchwork of little dots right let's say we've got to the bottom of the collar and we're going to now want to go in the opposite direction well there's no need to turn it around so you go across and you start here and you'll see the um, typical pattern which is created by going down and up and down and up you don't need to turn it around all that will happen is that your diagonal lines are alternate and on the back you have all of these little pinpricks imagine those in the the color of the fabric they're not that noticeable so there you go that's pad stitching enjoy and after quite a long time pad stitching it together this is the result. See the curve on it, that's fairly typical. And then if you look on the inside, you can see the prick stitches which come through the other side. Right, let's move on.
The coat facings are next. So we take these two pieces, the top and the bottom coat face, and all we need to do is to sew those across the bottom. Let's do those. With those sewn together, you then offer up the side lining. Now my lining is that uh, soft glazed cotton I mentioned. And uh, this is what you end up with. So the next thing is to put one half of the back onto it. And this is the piece. Now you'll see obviously that there are two curved seams here. And so it's going to be a situation where you've got to go through and pin it uh, so as to make sure that the two match each other. I've already done the other side so you can see what you end up with. So the next thing to do is, for each of those sides, sew them up. So once you put the two halves of the back on there, the final step is to sew up the centre of the back. Here I've got the two halves laid on top of each other, right sides to right sides. And so up the back we go. And there is our lining ready. Now, there's one more thing which needs to go on there, and that's the collar. Collar goes on, right sides to right sides. So I'm going to pin it, but then after that I will baste it, because trying to stitch it around these corners, you end up pricking yourself with the pins all the time. Now, don't forget your tailor's tacks you start stitching and you stop stitching where those are marked because you've got to have a little bit of allowance so you can turn that corner. Now you saw me fiddling and faddling as I went along that. For many years I was going along collars and wondering why I was catching them. It's because the material puckers up underneath as you're going around the corners. So do take care as you're going along there. It takes a bit longer, but my goodness me, it beats the frustration of having to unpick it all again. This is where we join the lining to the coat. There you go. Now, the pattern says that you've got to sew all the way from the bottom up around the top of the collar and down the other side but it does suggest that you might want to stop here where there's the intersection of the collar meeting the coat and i would certainly recommend that because this little transition here is worth taking a little bit of care with this is one of the more important of the reasons why you do these tailor's tacks. You see the patterns provided for a tailor's tack there, and there's also one on this. What you must make sure is that you don't, when you're sewing around, catch any of this into the sewing for that, because what's going to happen is, as you come round here, You've got to sew there, stop, and then start sewing along there. Let's see if I can make that turn at the collar a bit easier to understand with some pieces of paper. Here you are, running around your seam around the collar, and you're obviously, you're sticking those two pieces together. When you come to the dot, you've got to start sticking those two pieces together with thread. But if you leave that in position, that is going to pucker up. So you sew round to there. You then fold that seam out of the way. Get rid of that. 
and then you can sew along there without having this all puckered up in the joint and nowhere to go. All done. So, now is the time to turn the whole thing inside out and see the results of your work. Before we do that, probably a good idea to uh, just clip the edges. You want to get a nice crisp edge on those two points. So you're the underside of the collar, all of the pad stitching. Right, so I'm going to take this off to the ironing board, make sure all the points are properly pushed out, and then press it. And let's see what it looks like when I come back. There we are. It's beginning to look a bit more like what we're aiming for, doesn't it? You have another choice relating to pockets. Um, I've shown you the pockets which go into the back with those triangular flaps there. But you also have a choice of putting some pockets at the front. My experience has been that you can't have too many pockets, quite frankly, because normal Regency attire doesn't have an awful lot of pockets in the main uh, clothes that you have. So having some pockets in your overcoat or your duster is, I think, something that's worth having. If nothing else, they're decorative. So I had a look at this and I, I rethought the pockets and decided I want to put some on. So here we are with the pocket placed in relation to the flap. So the next thing we do is we take that flap off because we need to insert the pocket. And what we're going to do is cut through the front along this line and then push the pocket through the cut that we've created. But what we've got to do first is sew around the outside in order to create the lining for the hole. So here we are. I've got the lining out of the way behind. Bit of a faddle, but there we go. I've set the stitches quite short because um, we don't want any fraying on this edge. So there we are, the rectangle all stitched all around. So next we have to cut along the centre line in order to create the, uh, the opening. Making sure that you've got no uh, lining underneath, which I have just done. Cut along the centre line. Stopping short at the tip of that little triangle. And the same the other way. Now you need to take two lines going out to the very corners of the square there. At this point I like to use a craft knife because it's far more accurate. So going to the corner there. And that way. If you do it like this, you'll find that it will turn much more crisply and you can get nice crisp, crisp corners. Otherwise, if you if you do it wrong, that it'll it'll pucker. The other thing is, it allows you to take care to make sure you, you don't cut through the stitching that's gone round. Right, so we've created the hole, and what you then do is you push the lining 
through the hole and you take all the rest of this with it and there's your hole. Now let's turn it inside out so that we can see what it's like from the other side. And that's what it looks like from the other side. So you've got to take that now to the ironing board and press that. But can you see how clean and sharp those corners are? Uh, that's what you're aiming for. There we are, back from the ironing board and all nice and tidy. So the next step is to apply the other side of the pocket. Just lay it on top. and stitch all round. Then pin the flap on the top on the outside, leaving the pocket about in the middle because you're going to stitch down a little, say three quarters of an inch, and around the top and then down three quarters of an inch. And that's just to stop it flapping open all the time so it hangs nicely by the side of the coat. Do some invisible stitching along the edges and there you go. There we are. Worth taking the trouble, I think. But now what we've got to do is start tidying up the inside, ready for inserting the sleeves. So I've got to do a few bits and pieces inside with the lining to hold that in place, including the pockets, and also to uh, baste the lining and the fabric together around the arm sky. There, nice and neat and easy to work with. Right, we're moving on now. So putting the coat to one side, the next step is the sleeves. And if we look at the parts, what we have is the under sleeve, the upper sleeve, the under sleeve lining, and the upper sleeve lining. And these also have attached to them the cuffs, fabric lining. Here we have the upper sleeve and it's got marked on the pattern where you're expected to put your gathering stitches. If you want a, a puffy top, just between there and there. So the pattern says that if you want to reduce the appearance of gathers, take it all the way down to there. Let's see what it looks like. There we are. I've uh, used red to make it visible for you uh, and it doesn't matter because it's all within the seam allowance. Also, you see I've used quite small stitches because of the density of this material. Um, I might get away with it. Let's see what it's going to look like once we start fitting them together. But the next step is that we've got to sew the upper and the lower sleeve together. Now, I'm a bear of very little brain and it's easy to make mistakes. So when it comes to the sleeves, before you start sewing them together, lay them out together with the two sides matching, just to make sure you've got a left and a right rather than two rights or two lefts. Next, we start on the cuffs. So there are two pieces to each one. So that's two of the fabric and two of the linings and we stitch down the ends. And then you're going to sew around that edge. Now it might not fit exactly. Can you see how there's a little bit of a pucker there? So when you're sewing it, keep it under tension and then you won't end up with any puckers. turn it inside out. That enables you to press the seams and then once you've pressed the seams take the lining back but this time over the top of the fabric. 
try and get your seam nice and tidy because the next thing is that you're going to be attaching it to the sleeve and you can see that the lining is just a little bit shorter than the fabric there's a reason for that is that once it's turned inside out again it will tend to make the fabric just a little bit larger and therefore the lining won't show it'll end up like that this is the point where we attach the cuff onto the sleeve now bear in mind the sleeve hasn't yet been lined turn the sleeve so it's the right side out and then put the cuff over the top of the sleeve. Now notice that it's the open end of the cuff which is going up the sleeve. And what you have to do is to join these two ends here. When I first did this, I was looking for the extra lining for quite a while before I realized that the sleeve didn't have the lining on. So line everything up and then stitch around here. So having sewn it round, you trim the seam allowances and then you pull the sleeve down, sorry, the cuff down. And then you turn the whole sleeve inside out. Ready for the next step. These are the under sleeve linings, and here are the over sleeve linings. Put them together and sew them. So once you've pressed and clipped the sleeve, the, uh, the seams, and you then fold over at each end a five eighths, five eighths overlap, you then turn the linings inside out. And the next thing to do is you take the sleeve that it's going to go on to, Let's put that to one side and that to one side because this one is going to go over there. So you put it over the sleeve, wrong side to wrong side. Nice sleeve down. Eventually, you're going to turn it inside out so your lining goes on the inside. You then have to hand stitch the lining to the edge of the cuff. And work your way around. There, sleeves are done. I don't know about you, but I find sleeves absolute mind benders. Right, we're fixing the sleeve inside the coat now. And this is how we want it to be. Right side out, right side out. So you push the sleeve through the arm sky and you take the lining of the sleeve and you push it down inside out of the way because you're going to sew around here you'll see i've already done it but this is what you need to do you tighten up all the gathering stitches and then you sew all the way around the seam it takes time and you will end up with some 
puckering on the sleeve that you can see there. That's on this pattern and it's expected because you remember the pattern was talking about increasing or reducing the appearance of gathers. If you want a perfectly smooth transition here, you're going to have to alter the pattern shape. I don't have sufficient expertise to start changing things around and so I'm going to go with the pattern, even though ideally I would prefer a nice smooth transition like you'd see on a shirt or a blouse. But there we go, that's the way it was designed because don't forget, this is supposed to go on top of your full Regency outfit anyway, so it needs some space over the shoulders. Once you've sewn this, you then bring back the lining and you baste around and then carefully sew it in so that you have a continuous lining all the way from the body through and down into the sleeve. Now, doing that is everything gets all folded up so it's difficult to uh, film it properly but you get the gist as you're doing that what you're doing is folding under a seam allowance rather than sticking it straight on so that you have a neat finish once it's finally sewn in position there you can see that i finished basting it in position awaiting my spending a little bit more time to go around sewing it up here to the facing and then also sewing it to the lining as we get onto the lining parts. And there we have the linings now all sewn in. And while we're looking at the lining of the coat it's worth taking a look at the pockets because there they are now the pocket linings the front and the rear and um, it's worth thinking about tacking those together just here so as to keep them in the right place and once you've established the length of the coat that you want it to be think about where you're going to turn the facings because there's the facing coming down the vent and you want the hem at the bottom where you've set the right length to be folded over and to go underneath the facing as it comes down so you have a nice neat finish. So here we are we've sewn the sleeves in position now a few little puckers there but that's what the pattern expects and what's on the, the sleeve you see on the sleeve we've got the lining showing here what happens is you fold it over to form the cuff and it ends up like that. Once you've done that it's worth turning around to the back again because you're going to put some buttons on. There we are. I've chosen some wooden buttons because they look nice and rustic but you've got a button here that goes through the fabric the top of the pocket flap and the lining, so and the facing rather, which pins all of them together. The bottom button pins the pocket flap to the fabric and the lining. So that's serving a dual purpose because what it's doing is it's also holding your lining into position and stop that flapping around. So having done the buttons at the back, we've got to think about the buttons in the front now. Remember that it's got to part to go on either side of the horse. So you're not going to have buttons going all the way down the front of it. This is what perhaps Doctor Who would call a hero coat. It's going to have very flowing, wide, flapping tails on it all the way around because of that high vent at the back. It looks pretty cool. How many buttons do you need? Well, it's for you to choose. You can choose as many as you like. But they should, if you look at the seam, you see that it has a slight curve as it comes down there. 
don't have any buttons any further down than that because if you imagine sitting on a horse you'll be sitting down your pelvis is going to be about here so you don't want buttons going any further than that point where there's a slight deviation so choose as many as you like make them as big or as small as you like self-colored i'm going to go for wooden ones because they're a little bit they're a bit more informal and i think probably i'll put five or six on between there um, because it's a single closure it's single fronted i'm imagining it closing like that so that the hang on a second i'm a boy aren't i it's going to close like that so the buttons are going to be about here 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 let's get on with that what i like to do is make my buttonholes first so that i get them all nice and evenly done and then I can put the buttons on, moving around to get the fit I want, and then sew the buttons in place. I punched the holes in order to get my classic keyhole shape, but doing them manually, I couldn't quite get them as neat and tidy as I wanted them. And here's my first attempt using ordinary cotton doubled up, and then Here's my second attempt using button thread, that's heavyweight button thread. So I cheated. Don't tell anybody. But what I did was I used the button holding stitch on the straight lines and then finished it off manually with a stitch all the way round, which meant that I had the machine stitch to guide me along and make sure it was absolutely straight. But then the manual finishing meant that I had the knots along the inside to close off the uh, frayed ends on, the, on the, uh, the cut. So if you're not entirely confident about your buttonholes, that's a pretty good cheat. OK, I've finished the buttonholes now. And finally, this is the end result.